preface of the book of Genesis. Introduction. We're not actually going to get very deep into the book today. Genesis has such a fascinating background, it would only enhance the study if we were to look at a few points. We'll be reading from what's called the Net Bible, New English Translation, version 2, which comes with about 60,000 scholarly notes. Wow. They're all available through that online program. I'll be right after that tonight. Yeah. So my learning objectives. First, we shall know the genesis of Genesis. All right. Secondly, we shall affirm the antiquity of Genesis. And thirdly, we shall defend the authority of Genesis. Yeah, the best way to affirm the authority of anything is to obey it. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Right. He is the Alpha. So, I was in Spain attending a secret meeting of Christian Muslims from all over North Africa. I got to chatting with one from forgotten which country. I asked him how he came familiar with the gospel. He said, well, he said, somebody gave me a Bible. I opened up to the first page and it, he read this verse and he said, this tells me where we came from. <laughs> By the time he got to the gospels, he was a believer. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, the other thing is, it, it shows it was a start. There was a beginning. And there, was, there was something before the beginning and something after the beginning. All right. Or, there, have to, or there was nothing before the beginning. Next week, we're going to show some, <coughs> hopefully some amazing things about the grammar of the phrase, in the beginning. Now the earth was without shape and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the watery deep. But the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. Praise the Lord for the Holy Spirit. Now, almost every one of the words in that sentence is actually occurs in pagan accounts of origins, <coughs> carefully chosen for reasons of polemic. That is to say, a war of words about who is the true Creator God. God said, let there be light, <laughs> and there was light. When my wife was trying to teach creationism, there was one lady in particular who would never accept her thesis because she said there had to be a sun in order to be light. You mean there had to be Jesus in order there to be light? Because I was thinking God is light himself. Yeah, in God there is no darkness. And uh, so that it was darkness before light. And I was thinking, well, where's God's light? That's right. And Jesus said, I am the light, light of the world. He's the title of Genesis. You can see where it came from. There is the Greek on the left, Genesis, which means beginning. It was standard practice in the ancient Near East to call a literary work by its initial word or phrase. This verse starts out, Bereshit bara Adonai. If you go into Microsoft Word yeah. and you write something and then you save it without giving the title, the file is saved with the first part of what you wrote. Bereshit is actually two words, and the vowel that's chosen is very significant. Next week. Actually, the book of Genesis starts in Greek with a different word, in arche, in beginning. And the Gospel of John starts with the same phrase, in arche, very purposefully, by the way. Right? The historical setting. Where does the book of Genesis occur? Uh, includes, as you were about to say, First, pre-human origins. Yeah, I was just going to say that. Then what we'll call primal human history. How this race got started according to scripture, not according to evolution. And then the origin of sin and death, of law and morality. And before we get too far, Israel's ancestry. Of course, this was a book written by and for primarily Israel. Uh, the historicity of Genesis. What does this term historicity mean? I have no idea. That's right. <laughs> Actual historical fact. True to what really did happen. Historicity means it's true to fact. Of course, then you'd have to have a more true account by which to judge the historicity of this book. The historicity of Genesis is required in order for other things to be true. What are some of those other things? For Jesus to be truthful. Yes. Because Jesus did what? Assumed the historicity of Genesis. He did. <laughs> but could not Jesus make mistakes? Everybody does. 
Well, I'd like to mention Israel's right to occupy the land. If this is not true to fact, then they are just interlopers. They're invaders and had no right to go butcher those giant clans. Secondly, Mark just rightly pointed out Jesus' use of Genesis 1.27 and 2.24. Remember what he was talking about at that point? Marriage. Between a man and a woman, they'll become one flesh. And how many women for each man? One. Doesn't that get boring? No, it could. <laughs> and then much of the rest of Scripture appeals to the book of Genesis for its own authority. In other words, it appeals to the authority of Genesis to make its own argument. So, yeah, the rest of the Bible. And, of course, the uniqueness of Genesis amongst other ancient cosmologies, that is, other ancient explanations of how the world came to exist. If the Genesis isn't true, then it is simply a restatement of pagan mythology. And if you go to university, that's the explanation you will be given. Where did they get the explanation from? They sucked it out of their thumb. Well, let's go side trip then into the, the New Testament, which is important to Christian Jews and Christian Gentiles alike. Where are some of the places that Genesis is quoted? Matthew 19. Mark 13, 19, Jesus talks about the beginning of the creation. In Acts 14, we are reminded that God made heaven and earth. Then in Romans 1, since the creation, the, the truth about God's nature and his eternal power is apparent from what is made. And with the advances of 21st century science, we're still just as amazed, especially that you and I are here in a very organized, wonderful environment, living, self-conscious, and all of this is supposed to have come out of exploding gases under intense radiation. Abel offered a better sacrifice than that of his brother because he had faith. Cain killed his brother. Noah built a boat, we're told, in the New Testament. And then, oh, right, the flood came <laughs> and destroyed them. By faith, Abraham obeyed God. Praise the Lord for that. And then James reminds us that we know his faith was real because he turned around and obeyed it. He let his faith go to work. And then the story of Joseph, who was taken captive into Egypt, where he eventually became a savior to his own people. And by faith, Jacob blessed the sons of Joseph, as well as the rest of his own sons. So we see that the New Testament is well established, well planted into the book of Genesis. Or the authorship of this book. Who wrote Genesis? Don't know, do God. We? we don't know. God wrote Genesis. Well, he certainly <coughs> inspired it. The human name or names of the authors or editors of this book remain unknowns to us. I looked up all of the references in the New Testament to Genesis to see if anybody said, as Moses wrote in the beginning. They never say that, which is one of the astounding things about the New Testament. Its transmission and translation have been guided by God himself through millennia. We believe that the scripture that we have is inspired of God. Whatever happened to it down through the ages was refining it. Is it Hebrew tradition that attributes the first five books to Moses, the Torah? Yes, and it was called the books of Moses, not because he necessarily penned them, though he probably did many parts of it, but rather he is the main character of those five books, except Genesis. He wasn't there yet. We are not required to believe evangelical tradition in order to believe the Bible, but we try to be honest with what we know. So had Genesis not been revealed, then every generation would have deduced God's nature from observing his creation. So we didn't have to have Genesis, but we're glad we do because it connects God's existence and his nature with what's going on in our world and brings us his law and his hope, which we could never have deduced from looking at nature. 
If you just look at human behavior in your own lifetime and assume that we are as God created us, then what could we deduce about God? That he was a sinner. He was violent. Yeah. He hates little children. Yes. He loves to slaughter. Oh. He makes war. He, he created volcanoes. We need Genesis. Absolutely. Amen. What's the purpose of the book of Genesis then? It's the beginning of the love story. Here are some suggestions. First, it was written to pursue a polemic against pagan cosmologies. If you've never read the creation and flood accounts in the Babylonian material, I will send you some links. Recommend that you get read up a bit in ancient mythology. And you discover that when the Hebrews were composing Genesis, they were already in the midst of a discussion over which gods created everything, and which gods created which other gods, and which gods were sleeping with whom, and so forth. Genesis helps us to define a theological worldview for human thought, belief, and morality. Far more of what we believe comes right out of this book than I often think about. Perhaps also to help distinguish the divine nature from everything that's being created. Uh, other people groups had what they called nature gods, that there's a different god in charge of each part of nature. And many traditional South Asians to this day, the reason for which they hold to many gods is that each god is in charge of something that they need. The god of the soil, the god of the rain, the god of the sun, the god of the herds, the god of fecundity, the god of strength, the god of war. And one of the ways in which Indian Christians evangelize is to go into a community and ask, what are the current problems that you are dealing with here in your community? Well, maybe the rains haven't come yet and we're worried whether we'll have a crop this year. Or the soil's not fertile. And then you ask, well, which god is in charge of the rain? And they say, well, that's so-and-so. Well, our God Jesus, he is stronger than that God. We're going to pray right now to Jesus that he will send rain. And so they pray and ask God to send rain. If it doesn't rain, they scuttle out of town as quickly as they can. But as often as not, it will rain. Or whatever it is. The gods of sickness and health, you go around and you pray for the sick who have been trying the other god who is currently failing. One of the big polemics throughout the, the Old Testament is which god sends rain. And then to assert the will and power of a singular divinity over all creation. There is somebody who is stronger than creation and he can work out his will by his power in the world as we experience it. Genesis is true. If first class condition Jack, what is it? It's true. It's true. <laughs> There's some unique things about the God of the Bible. I would like to assert that the biblical God has no imaginable pre-creative or primordial cause. You see, if some other God created our God, then what would be the question? Who created, who, who created the first God? Can you think of a religion that actually teaches that the current God had a father? Mormonism. Mormonism. The question to pose to a Mormon would be? It was the first created man. <laughs> yeah, keep pushing that back. They have no clear answer. In fact, they have no clear answer for anything. So this is one reason for which the God of the Bible is often called the first cause. What could you safely say about the God of the Bible if everything physical and material, all space, time, and energy, and matter came from him, what could you say about him? He is not those things. He is totally other. He has no equal. We could never imagine what he's like, which is probably the main reason of the word holy as applied to God in the Bible. I was thinking, you know, I think with kids, sooner or later a kid asked, well, who made God? And you have to explain a little bit more about, about that. But it's interesting, too, when you read things online, there are full-grown adults who still say, well, then who made God? As if that was a clever argument. Um, it's like, well, 
there has to be something eternal. Um, although, I guess some physics say, no, there wasn't. Nothing exploded. Um, and so it all had a beginning, but it didn't begin from anything. But I mean, just common sense would tell you there has to be yeah. a first cause. I was listening to a well-educated evolutionist just this last week, and he says, we know evolution is true, for we are here. Oh, that's a circle. Well, you know, I guess one answer for, for some, uh, an evolutionist, you know, that believes in the Big Bang Theory, and I go, well, how do you know there was a Big Bang when you hear? And there are those who are coming out now, among materialists, saying, well, yeah, there was a bang, but it wasn't so big. <laughs> the little bang theory. <laughs> a lawful, law-enforcing God creates a world that can be studied scientifically. A professor of some Eastern University was pointing out that the scientific method and the Enlightenment could only have come out of Christianity. That the pagan gods were too capricious. The world attributed to the pagan gods were just simply a playground for them, and they were doing anything they wanted. And therefore, no matter what you studied or thought that you had learned, they could just undo it. And then Islam's God is too arbitrary. The most common phrase for anything to this day that might or might not happen is, Inch'Allah, if God wills. That kind of God did not give rise to a belief that the created world is so orderly and law-abiding that it's worth studying. So when we talk about the laws of nature, this implies that whatever created nature is lawful, dependable, regular. Now this does not mean that God could not or does not intervene in his creation, but whenever he does, he never violates his own laws. So how did Jesus walk on water? Ice. <laughs> no. He knew where the rocks were, enforcing God. There are certain laws that God created, the law of gravity, the laws of physics, things that we observe and we can prove them over and over and over again. One of the laws of physics is, is uh, the second law of thermodynamics, that things always decay, things always decay over time. And yet the evolutionist says things have just done the opposite. Things got more complicated over time, and that's yeah, that's funny. The theory of evolution isn't even a good theory; it's just a hypothesis. I mean, right. know it's not true, but uh, things always decay over time, hmm. and, and yet they say just the opposite. Even living organisms tend to disorder. Anybody in this room disagree? <laughs> day by day. In the book of Genesis, whilst there is a God. And there are spiritual beings. What we do not see are fantastic legends about warring gods or cavorting demigods. No, two talking creatures, aren't there? The serpent, who we find out later in scripture was not a snake. <laughs> that was the devil. And then, of course, Balaam's ass. But it was an angel who was speaking through it. And then there is no race people, nation, or tribe that deserves to rule over others or to abuse them. That includes Israel. They have no innate right. Whereas the pagan mythology almost always makes our tribe to be the best, the nicest, the goodest, the strongest, or the most evil, and therefore we have the right to rule over others. Or we are so intelligent that we have captured the economies of every nation in the world, and we will shape the world into the paradise that our tribe deserves. All right, what's the message of this book? Uh, here's some insight from uh, at the Lexham commentary on Genesis 1 through 11, which is free if you download the free Logos Bible software version, which includes uh, original languages, dictionaries, encyclopedias, many commentaries, interlinears, so you can... As a prequel, Genesis 1 through 11 provides a background to the message of the entire Bible. It introduces God, reveals his power in creation, and illuminates God's expectations for humanity. What are the major themes of the book of Genesis? What are the big ideas? The broad brush strokes. What are some that come to your mind? The creation, the fall, the flood, the flood. Beginning of Israel. Yahweh is the creator of all things. So why did he say, let us make man 
in our image. The cosmic conflict between God and the gods. It starts right there in Genesis chapter 6. In fact, chapter 3 already. Behind the wickedness of human history, there is another conflict going on in which we are the pawns. What about the wickedness of humanity and the problem of sin? How did we become the way we are? We ate from the tree. God's dispersion of humanity. This is a, a big story that even helps to explain the themes of the New Testament, especially the book of Acts, the career of Paul, of reaching out into all of the dispersed nations. And even why in the conquest of Canaan, Every people group was given the opportunity to emigrate, to pick up and get out of the way and leave. They could take their children, their herds, their gods, and just get out of Canaan. But if they resisted and refused, they were destroyed. So it was just before chapter 11, the Tower of Babel, or after? From the Tower of Babel, the peoples were dispersed. According to Deuteronomy, God put angels in charge of all the nations. Some of them became corrupt. We began worshiping those angels as gods and gave them names from whence came the mythologies that we've learned since childhood. And then of course God's choosing of Israel because they were righteous, because they were more intelligent, more handsome. Oh, we haven't figured out yet just why Yahweh chose a moon worshiping pagan. All right. Literary genre. What kind of writing is this? Is this poetry? Is this a biography? Is it history? Mystery? What is it? All of the above. It's the truth. Uh, at the least, it's a mix of prose and poetry. As we shall see, characteristics of Hebrew poetry is not that it rhymes, but rather what? Parallel ideas or contrasting ideas. There will be poetic phrases even interspersed in prose text. Is this a history or myth, fact or fable? It is a mixture of both. There is a lot of mythological language in the book. It would, would, it, would it be history and fact? The book is at war against existing myth and fable. It's what some call an etiology. If you're medical, you know the word etiology. That is. What caused this disease? In other words, it deals with sources and origins. What would be the difference between a source and an origin? The source has already been originated. The stories make sense when read as a traditional Israelite account of origins. Probably inspired by the very God that it talks about. Because it's a God who could do this. Most of the other gods could never have come up with the book of Genesis. For one thing, they would never exalt Israel. Let's look at some of the sources. What are existing things that could have been brought into this book? Oral uh, stories passed on. The entire Pentateuch itself came to us as an anonymous work, I think. Ancient writings and oral tradition. There may have been other written things. Some of the pagan writings and things, they're not 100% inaccurate. That's right. And the Bible apparently borrows from a lot of those stories, but they borrowed this part of the story that was accurate, not the part that was inaccurate. Other mosaic writings could be included in Genesis, definitely in Exodus and Deuteronomy, where it's recounted how that the Lord spoke to Moses and said, write these things down, preserve them for Israel to remember. Then there are probably pagan materials, especially their language that has been incorporated. And then there was obviously editorial work. Can you think of some passages that Moses himself could not have written? <laughs> Where it talks about Moses uh, being uh, dying. Mm -hmm. Scribble emendations, meaning scribes sometimes altered things or made mistakes. Uh, if any of you went to college, and you listen to your professors talk about the origin of the Bible, then you learned the documentary hypothesis, as it's commonly called, which developed in the 19th century in German universities. And as they began translating those, they assumed that, oh, the Bible either 
borrowed heavily from the pagans, since we know that the Hebrews were too stupid to make up their own stories. Do you think anybody else could ever have taken a Hebrew story and adopted it? Nah. <laughs> but as to the Bible itself, the theory is that what we have today is a combination of earlier written documents that somewhere along the way were woven together. One of these ancient documents we refer to as the J document from the name Jehovah, which was a German spelling pronounced Y, not J. You know, English, I think it was only in the 16th century, introduced the letter J because the British royalty and the gentry, they spoke French for centuries. And in French, there's a J sound. And English had no J sound. So we borrowed the J from German. It was not J, it was Y, to represent the J sound, which we adopted and brought into English. So any passage that uses the name Yahweh is said to be from the J document. Then there's the E document from the name Elohim. So any passage that has the Elohim name in it comes from that document. What do you suppose they do with the passages that talk about Yahweh Elohim, the Lord God? Well, it's proof that it's com they're combined together. That's proof. <laughs> Overly dramatic. <laughs> then the P document uh, from our word priest. What do they say in German? And this is the passage that will usually will use other names of God, such as El or Almighty. And also, wherever it talks about the generations or the records of, these were written by priests. Because priests were trying to fake their own history to keep their power over the people. And it may have been priests who brought this all together to just demonstrate their right to rule, or their right to the tithes. But there is also the residual material, which is everything else. Larger hypothesis, there's also the D document, which does not apply to Genesis. And that is the earliest version of Deuteronomy, which of course was brought into the Pentateuch eventually as Deuteronomy. Uh, do we believe this? Yes and no. I mean, we do believe that there were sources, but this is kind of a way of saying it's just a call together mess. The theory does have some weaknesses. Uh, let's see if we can critique it for a moment. First, there's no such documentary evidence. No one has ever found even a scrap of one of those other documents. And so it's a, it's a hypothesis. Secondly, since the time that this thesis or this hypothesis was formulated, which is still taught to this day in universities and some seminaries, other ancient literary works have been discovered that employ multiple names and titles of their gods. So the discovery of the Ugaritic material especially, you would call your god El, the Almighty, the King of the Worlds, the Giver of Life and Water, the Impregnator of Goddesses. And so the fact that our Bible uses several names for the deity was just consistent with the literary forms of the time. Same words and phrases occur in all passages supposed to be from different sources. There are certain phrases they thought could only have been written by a Yahwist, an Elohist, or a priest, but you can find them in the, the passages attributed to the other documents. Those scholars often mistook editing for different sources. The account of Moses' death, that had to be from a different document because Moses could not have written his own death account. Yeah, we accept it. The text has been edited. Could have been edited as it was being written. And then it's basically circular reasoning. So you take clues or proofs of your theory uh, to be the very evidence that is explained by the theory. In other words, your theory came out of reading the text. Now you go back and you read the text again, and sure enough, your theory seems to be true.
All right, a lot of interpretations of this book have popped up through history. Uh, who, are, who have been first? The Greek Septuagint translation, no earlier than 3rd century BCE, interpreted the book in order to translate it. Other ancient cultures and cosmologies take the same material of Genesis and give it, uh, give it different meanings. Then we have the Aramaic Targums, which are translations with comments of most of the Hebrew Bible. You can download the Targums online free. Some of them are interesting, some a bit fantastic, but it goes to show that the Jews themselves often interpreted the book of Genesis to mean things that to you and me just are not obvious. Then there's other ancient Jewish literature. For example, the book of Enoch, which has a lot of detail about the fallen sons of God, how they got here and what they did and what they taught the humans to do, their names and where they are now and what the judgment that God has in store for them, and the, the so-called book of Jasher. You know, the Old Testament talks about the book of Jasher as being a source for some of the material of Old Testament characters. He, the Jews, wrote a book of Jasher to kind of summarize what they believed to be, at the time, the material that the Bible left out. So it's, it's a fascinating read in that regard, and it interprets a lot of the book of Genesis. Well, you, you also see, like during the time of the kings, where they'll talk about books this, this guy is written down in the books of the king of Judah, or this right. guy is written down in the books of the kings of Israel. That's right. Yeah. And we don't have those either. We don't. There's the, the Talmud itself, a distillation of rabbinic commentaries and wisdom from, from down over the centuries. In fact, the, the, the Talmud is so rich and thick, you can spend your life just studying the Talmud. Uh, and there, there are men and a few women who actually do that. And a lot, when a Jew comes up with a really clever answer to anything you say, he possibly took it from the Talmud. And then there were the Christian church fathers, that is the earliest Christian writers. They had their own take on the book of Genesis. And today we use a lot of linguistics, anthropology, and sociology to help us understand what the text probably meant to its earliest writers and readers. And of course, all of us have our personal impressions and our, our favorite guesswork. It's the typical evangelical Bible study. The Church Fathers' Views, assembled by a guy named Craig Allert in an interview on Naked Bible Podcast from 2018. He observed that our Church Fathers read Genesis looking for what he calls higher meanings. That is, we, here's what the text says, what does it imply, and what, or what can we infer from this? And there were two main schools at the time, centered at two different cities. In the city of Antioch in Syria, which had a huge Christian population, many churches, they used what's called the rhetorical method to understand the book of Genesis. By rhetoric they mean, the text itself implies other meanings without saying it. One of their examples, God must have first created matter from nothing, that's what ex nihilo means, from which he then fashioned the world. He didn't make the mud as he was making the humans, it already made the mud. Then you had the, in the city of Alexandria, a huge Jewish, eventually Christian center, Greek-speaking city in Egypt, the Alexandrians, they used a more philosophical method. They start with Genesis, and then what did the philosophers say, and how do they agree? So for them, the biblical text was a kind of code that must be broken. For example, Plato was right. The world must have been created from existing matter. Otherwise, there was nothing for God to use. All right, some tentative conclusions then about the book of Genesis. I conclude, Genesis was revealed or inspired by the Creator Himself. I don't see any other possible origin. 
Secondly, it has been transmitted to every generation since ancient times, some of it from before Moses. Then Genesis serves as a standard of truth for human speculation and belief. Finally, Genesis must be transmitted and translated for every ethnicity.